I'd been there about three days, sat in the mess having my dinner when the air raid siren went off. And actually, I dived up thinking everyone was going to run to the nearest shelter, and everyone went, it's too late. If that's gone off, it's already, it's already going to land. You may as well finish your dinner. Because you're not, wherever you think you're going to get to, you just won't. So my name is Phil Herbert. Um, I served as an armourer from uh, 1997 to 2013, um, left as a corporal weapons instructor at RF Cosford. So my role was leading a team of armourers um, responsible for all of the explosive countermeasures, chaff and flare for all British aircraft. So that was the Hercules fleet, the Harrier fleet and the Chinook fleet, which was a big job. Um, and then ultimately that became also for the Reapers and the Predators and the Royal Navy aircraft that came out before I came back. We then were responsible for the Royal Navy uh, Sea Kings um, from two different elements. I deployed out um, in the May, came home in the October, November of uh, 2008 Kandahar was, was strange and it was, the, even the night I got there was strange because I was picked up by the other armourers who I was replacing and I got there in the middle of the night and went straight to work. Literally put my stuff in the back of the pickup and I was like, well, they were at work. So I just went straight to work and did a 12 hour shift when I got off the plane. <laughs> Didn't even go, go, go and get any sleep, just... <laughs> put my kit on, went to work, got to know the unit, got to know the station, got to know where everything was, because the following day that was it, that was in. It was really hot in the summer, really hot, really dusty. They spend an awful lot of time driving around with um, water bowsers, um, spraying, the, spraying the roads, because the dust, more often than not, got so bad you couldn't see a hand in front of your face. Um, Unbelievable, never seen anything like it. It looked like fog, but it wasn't, it was dust. Um, but then if it rained, it would, it would wash bridges away. It washed the bridge away. Um, there was a bridge in the middle of the bomb dump and we had a massive downpour one night, washed the bridge away. I'd been there about three days, sat in the mess having my dinner when the air raid siren went off. And actually I dived up thinking everyone was gonna run to the nearest shelter and everyone went, it's too late. If that's gone off, it's already it's already going to land. You may as well finish your dinner because you're not wherever you think you're going to get to. You just won't. So that was kind of a okay. I've got to readjust my mindset as to what it's like here. If you can, you will. But then I realised where actually I, where I worked, it was one of the few places on the station that didn't have any form of air raid protection. We had an ISO container with a kind of a deck on the top of it, and that's where everyone went and sat. When the siren goes off, that's either a mortar attack or a rocket attack. More often a rocket because of distance, because the mountains were about five miles away. Um, we knew that they would only ever fire two or three rounds because the QRF was two squadron RF regiment at the time and they would be right on it. Also, their mortar teams would return fire, but it was either mortars or rockets and it did happen. I mean, within a week, that had happened three or four times. Um, like I say, we've, uh, you know, I've got photographs now of the, the blast wall by our block, absolutely peppered to hell with one of the rounds went off just the other side of that. Um, one night I was in the prep shed with one of my young airmen, um, prepping chaff and flare for the Hercs. Um, and basically we worked um, Z where everywhere else was working local. Um, so our shift pattern was almost 12 hours away from everyone else, but we did it because there wasn't that much in the way of prep facility. So when we needed it, Taz didn't. It, you know, it meant everyone could work properly 
um, and the prep shed was right next to the fence and three water rounds landed just the other side of the fence, literally 20, 30 yards away from the prep shed, which we were sat in full of explosive. But again, what I said to my young airman was, just keep going. If it's landed now, it's landed now. It hasn't hit us. Chances are it's not going to, and there's nowhere for us to go anyway. So just put your helmet on, get to it. If it's going to land on this building, there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. Where, uh, where the bomb dump um, was sighted was actually almost as close to the mountains that Kandahar gets. It's one of the places that did get hit. Although they could hit anywhere on the station, to be fair. But you always thought, yeah, okay, every time we go down there, this could happen. And we were down there almost every night. You honestly thought that every day? You had to think, yeah. I mean, but you, you, you thought about it, but you couldn't let it dwell on it because otherwise you'd never go there. You couldn't do your job, you couldn't operate. You just couldn't think like that. But that definitely focused it. That was, it, was, it only happened once down that way, to be fair. Um, as much landed near the blocks as anywhere else. Or um, certainly there was a, a crossroads um, right by the Canadian um, sort of social area. Um, and four rockets landed in the middle of that. Um, it was one of those. Um, and that was probably more luck than judgment that nobody got hurt. I think it, so it came in at like two, three in the morning when nobody was really around. So where the Dutch had their flight line was sort of closer to the mountains. They tended to be more of the, the target. But the, the other thing was that they tended to attack at night. And although it was a 24-7 operation, obviously less people are around. I think that was, that was probably what saved more people than the fact that they weren't hitting it because they were pretty regularly, to be fair. All of the repatriations were done through the British Herc line and by the RAF, regardless of nation. So that was, um, at the time, that was, we had uh, Danes, Dutch, Americans, Romanians, um, British, obviously. Um, and so it wasn't just a repatriation. That's why we were doing more. We'd probably do two or three a week, potentially. Um, not all the time, but we, we definitely had periods where, you know, because everyone was operating in different places. And even if these were guys were coming up from Bastion, this could have been US Marines or um, whatever coming up from Bastion. Um, and part of the ground crew had to be one of the weapons engineers. So you had to be part of the ceremony. You had to be there as a safety person and, and all of you know all of the jobs that you would normally do um, but because it was more ceremonial or as you had to be a part of that you couldn't just be there um, and so what we you know originally we said right okay we'll do one you know we'll just rotate um, but most of my guys that were working with me were like 18 19 um, and I could just see after a few weeks that it was really starting to affect them. Like literally one of the lads was struggling just to get out of bed. It was really just seeing coffins every, and it wasn't always one. You know, sometimes we were putting three or four on the back of an aircraft. Um, and it was just making him really miserable, really, really down. And they were all young lads. So I decided I would do all of them. Um, regardless of whether I was on shift or not, I would do them. Um, to make sure that they carried on doing what they needed to do for me and for the, you know, for the deployment. So, um, but I think it definitely took its toll, <laughs> ultimately. I mean, I was in my late thirties then. And they were my guys at the end of the day, they were, so yeah. But I did that for probably four months which is a lot of bodies I put back on aircraft. I haven't really talked about that for a long time, to be fair. So... I know I, I, that, yeah, I did all of that. Um, and I know uh, the warrant officer that was in charge of it, because he was actually from Halton, was a really good friend of mine. Um, well, actually there was two. It was the, the, the SWO from Halton was running it. Um, and 
and uh, it affected him pretty badly. Um, but another friend of mine um, who was uh, the forensic dental warrant officer at Alton said, okay, right, I'm going to do half of these, but he was a friend of mine as well, because um, his uh, wife ran the pub at the end of my mum and dad's road. <laughs> um, so, uh, but we kind of, it, it was it was good, it was all people that knew each other, even though we, you know, I'd known them from my time at Alton when I was, when I was there. Um, but it was, it was, that was one good thing, that it was working with people that I'd known for 10, 15 years by that point. Everyone came back through there. Um, we were also dealing with a lot of the Kazabak type stuff. Um, I didn't realise that you could back a Herc up under the back, uh, under the tail end of a C-17, um, but you can. <laughs> um, because we were, were told um, one night, Um, that they were, sorry. Uh, that they were, they've been working on guys um, in the Chinooks. Uh, carried on, they got onto Bastion, um, straight onto a Herc. Um, we're working on them all the way back. Um, but these were, this was stuff that couldn't wait till they got to the QE. Um, <coughs> so they'd set up a C-17 um, uh, with a Harrier actually in the front of it, um, broken down going back to the UK, um, and then um, four full operating theatres. Really haven't spoken about a lot of this for a long time. <coughs> and, um, yeah, they came in, I don't know, it's like three o'clock in the morning and you can literally back a herc up under the tail of a C-17 and we all moved them while the medics were still working. Straight from one to the other. And then straight into proper theatre. Once they were in the air, they were in, they were in theatre, effectively. I was very proud of that, that we were a part of that process of getting the guys, injured guys from the battlefield back to the QE and made it absolutely seamless. And when I do say seamless, I meant they were being worked on from the second they left the battlefield to the time that they were in a hospital bed in the QE. So we'd got, um, at the time, I'm with my uh, now ex-wife, but I had three small children um, one of whom was only a few months old, uh, one who was in nursery and one who had just started school. Um, the run up to the deployment, I think what I guess people don't realise is that a four to six month deployment is more like a 12 month deployment because I actually ended up doing um, a HGV driving course which took me away for six weeks um, up at uh, RF Leckenfield, or is it? It's not RAF Leckenfield now, is it? It's um, Defence School of Driving. Um, I ended up doing two courses down at RF Lynham because I'd never worked on Herx before. And I also had to go to RF Marham um, to do the full bomb prep um, lead course um, with, ta with the Tactical Armament Squadron because I might have had to have done that. Um, although it wasn't my role, um, the potential was that I could have been pulled into TAS to run bomb, pe tr you know, bomb prep teams, although I was, to be honest. I think that may have been the biggest bombing campaign since Dresden if we'd have gone down that, for t if they'd have needed me, but we had to do it. So it was almost six months worth of courses before you go away. Then the, 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 you know, the, the pre-deployment course as well, the only good thing about the pre-deployment course is because I was on the Harrier Force, we could do that. We did it at Cosmore, which is where I was based at the time. So I didn't have to go away for that at least. That was just at work. Um, but obviously a lot of people did have to go away for that. Do kids remember, um, yeah, quite young or whatever, do, do they remember that period of time? They do, and it, the, the effect it definitely had on them. Um, and when I got back from Afghanistan, I was posted immediately to Odium. So I was going to be going back more regularly. Um, and the effect it definitely had on them was if they saw my, um, my Bergen, 
in the hall or if they saw my body armour or anything, they immediately kind of went into a bit of a flat spin because they just figured I'd be going away again. Because they'd never really had that. Um, I'd only been going away um, previous to Cottesmore, I was at Stafford. Um, so I did do some work with TSW, um, but it was never away for more than a few days, a week. Um, you know, but it wasn't a deployment per se. Um, but with the Afghanistan thing, they kind of knew body armour and helmets and holsters and all, all the other stuff came along with the territory. So then when we got to Odium, every time they saw body armour or helmets in the hall, they all kind of went into a bit of a flat spin over it. So you're going away for six months again. And um, But actually that's why I put in to go to Odium because the Chinook guys were only doing six weeks at a time. You went more often, but you didn't go, you were doing it short, regular bursts, which is what um, Odium were doing and Lynham were doing at the time. At the time, my, my wife um, was, was reasonably ill, so she was kind of sort of struggling with some stuff, three small children. But to be fair, Cottesmore was, because of the nature of the unit, she had a really good support system. And I knew that I could focus somewhat on what I was doing because of it. Um, because it was a deployable unit, it was quite a close-knit community. Uh, I'm not saying all RAF units aren't, but we know that some are more than others. Um, and also, we were quite lucky when we moved to Cottesmore. Um, we'd been at Stafford before that, and at the same time, uh, MCSU and 2MT moved to Whittering and Cottesmore with us, effectively. We'd gone because I was promoted. But what it meant is that my wife had a lot of friends of wives from TSW, 2MT, um, 5001, all of those guys moved across to, to, Cottesmore, to Cottesmore and Whittering with us, so that was good, I was, I was, that was helpful. Um, and also uh, my eldest son was uh, at school with my wing commander's daughter. Um, so my wife and his wife became friends because of the kids, because they were all at school together. Um, and that <laughs> my wing commander was coming out fairly regularly because of the Harrier Force being there. So. He was, he'd only be there for a few days, but he stayed in the same block as us. So would, I'd always get, you know, if I couldn't talk from somebody from home, I was quite lucky in so much as he'd come out, we'd go for a coffee. <laughs> let him know, yeah, let me know that everyone was kind of being kind of kept an eye on at least at home, which was handy for me. I was quite lucky because, let's say, we were working Z, not local. So um, I could, you know, when the, you know, the phone booths which the Americans put in were absolutely rammed in the day in Afghanistan, my daytime was the middle of the night. So my midday was midnight out there. So I could dive in, have a quick call home. Didn't really have to fight for the phones, but that was more, again, I'd say more luck than judgment. Um, but actually my wife, um, I think people go one, one of two ways. They don't want to know what you're doing or they do want to know what you're doing. My wife absolutely was, I don't really want to know what's going on. Um, but she got used to quite quickly if obviously every, there was a complete media blackout every time somebody got killed. And that happened fairly regularly, whether it was at Kandahar or Bastion, but as soon as anything like that happened, there was a, yeah, there was a media blackout, all the phones got shut down, all the internet got shut down. So she knew she didn't hear from me for a few days, which potentially they would do that. That was the reason, but she just didn't want to know. My mum, on the other hand, wanted to know everything. My mum sat in front of the TV and watched the news for nearly six months, and every time I spoke to her, and I tried to speak to my mum and dad like once a week or whatever, she was like, whatever you're allowed to tell me, I want to know what you've been doing. And kind of didn't shy away from the fact of what was happening and raining rockets and um, all of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, my time out there was not a bad time, but you like, uh, I've, I've said this a few times over the years, you come back changed. Not broken, but you come back changed, without a doubt, clearly. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, the, the, te and the team was top to bottom, I, I can say hand on heart. And, and I, was, I, I felt I was really lucky actually, because the block I lived in was um, sort of the waifs and strays, because we weren't on a squadron, um, or whatever. So we had our room, which was armourers. Um, in the next room, we had the wing commander and the padre. <laughs> um, 
but we were all, but actually, what, uh, and my flight commander, because he was just out there with Taz. Um, but it meant that we were much closer than you'd ever be in the UK. Ever be in the UK. Um, I stayed very good friends with my flight commander for a long time after that. Yeah, my time in the service, without a doubt, has, has benefited me as a person. It's benefited me in the last 10 years since I've left. Um, it's helped me to help the people that I do. It's helped me to work with the people that I do because I work now with young people. Um, certainly my last posting was as an instructor at Cosford. I now teach uh, the same age group, but the guys I teach now aren't always as fortunate as my young airmen. Um, they're just not. You know, these are guys from quite deprived areas um, in a lot of cases. And, and I say that, some of them are from down here, some of them are from Birmingham. Um, I've worked with lads in the northeast who are all trying to make their lives better by becoming good engineers. Um, some of my engineers have decided to finish their apprenticeships and then think I'm going to join the military, and they have. Quite a lot of them actually. Um, which is good and I always encourage that. I've done a few references um, for, for lads um, who have, have done their apprenticeship. Uh, one of my guys who graduated last year um, did his apprenticeship with BSA Guns. Um, he's now going to be a submariner. Um, so the Navy were very keen to, to commission him. So I use a lot of what I learned in the military to teach them how to be good leaders, to talk to people, to question, to yeah, all of that stuff, which are uh, actually a lot of the guys that do my job with my company, there's a lot of us that are veterans. Um, I actually spent yesterday mentoring um, our newest member of staff who has just left the Air Force. Um, but if we give back what we learn, most of the lads, even if they say to civilians, um, most of the guys I've taught over the last 10 years are now managers. But actually a lot of them are going to be commissioned. One's been commissioned into the Navy, one's gone to Remy to be commissioned. Um, yeah, very, very proud of them, to be fair.